Hello, I'm Dave Kastner, and I'm going to talk to you about the wants, needs, and challenges in biomedical surface analysis. Uh, biomedic, just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, the way I view biomedical surface analysis is surfaces are where all the action occurs. At the, it is at the interface between a material and the biological environment. So any material that's put in a biological environment, whether it's an implant material that's put in the body or a diagnostic device that's used uh, in assays, it's that surface region where all the action occurs. That's where proteins absorb, cells attach, inflammation and uh, biofilms form, all those sorts of things. So if we want to understand and control the biological performance of a material, we need to know in as much detail as possible what's the surface uh, composition, structure, orientation, spatial distribution, et cetera, so we can make a relationship between surface properties and biological performance. And to do that requires state-of-the-art instrumentation, development of specialized experimental protocols, and data analysis methods. Some of the ultimate goals, that uh, these are some of the ones on my list, it's certainly not exhaustive, and an exhaustive list uh, uh, are to determine uh, structural determination of biomolecules on surfaces. So protein structure, uh, that sort of thing. And obviously biological uh, environments are very complex. Many times the materials put into those biological environments are complex. So these are very, uh, real challenges for surface and, and interface analysis is how do you get detailed information about the structure of a surface when you have these complex environments. Uh, in recent years in the biomedical field, there's been a lot of, of interest in uh, uh, nanoparticles. Until the last few years, there hasn't been a whole lot of emphasis on that community on surface characterization, which is a bit unfortunate because uh, it's the surface properties of those nanoparticles which give them their unique properties. So it's really important to characterize uh, those uh, nanoparticle surface chemistry and structure. Ideally, you'd like to do it in situ, which makes it particularly challenging. And also, you'd like to do it on a particle by particle basis. Most of the techniques we have involve ensemble averaging. So um, lots of challenges there. There's also this whole field of, of 3D imaging of cells and tissues to really see, get subcellular resolution, where are nanoparticles going in a, in a cell that's been exposed to, to nanoparticles, et cetera. So I won't have time to talk about all of these, but I'm gonna focus on protein and peptide structured surfaces, and also a little bit about uh, nanoparticle characterization. So, because so, this is mostly a forward-looking talk, of where we're trying to, where we are right now, where we're trying to, it's always informative to look back in time, where have we come as a society and, and in terms of biomedical surface analysis. Well, 25 years ago, there was no biointerfaces division. Uh, that was long before that. And the reason I picked 25 years is 25 years ago was the first time I attended ABS as a biomedical surface scientist. Uh, before that, I had always been involved in single crystal chemisorption, catalysis, and that sort of thing. So I attended ABS for many years prior to that, but always in a different field. So uh, it's interesting to look back and see where it's, it's come. Uh, biomedical surface analysis at that time was really polymer surface analysis. It was looking at, and polymers are widely used as biomaterials, so it's a, it's a good starting point. Most of them were single technique characterization, typically XPS. And uh, the one thing that, that really surprised me moving from the catalysis to the biomedical community, in the catalysis community, everybody appreciated the need for properly characterizing your surfaces, and it was ingrained in that community, and everybody did it. But the biomedical community at that point in time, 25 years ago, really uh, a major uh, component of, of, of the people doing biomedical surface analysis was to educate the rest of the biomedical community on the need for uh, understanding what goes on on the surface. So, so really, uh, uh, like, uh, like we've come a long ways. We may not uh, be all the way to where we want to go, but we've really made a lot of progress is kind of the take home message. And just uh, uh, to put this in context, then a year after that first meeting I attended at a biomedical uh, surface analysis, I'd just been working at the University of Washington for a month, so I didn't have anything ready to present. But the next year, 
uh, was my first biomedical surface analysis presentation, and it was, to no surprise, XPS characterization of polymers for biomedical applications. And so here's the little summary abstract that appeared in JBST that uh, uh, shows that. So again, that was pretty typical of the things that we were, we were looking at subtle uh, differences in C1S binding energies of the carbamate versus urea carbon, and, and really trying to understand how uh, manufacturing additives such as lubrication waxes and things like that, how that affected the surface chemistry of polymers. Uh, so, so some very, very fun surface science, very, you know, uh, got very detailed information. Uh, so that's kind of where this, this field started from. And I'll use the evolution of the, of the center I now direct, the National Eskin Surface Analysis Center for Biomedical Problems, uh, as a way of, to kind of show how, how things have changed over the years. As I mentioned, it started out uh, when, when Buddy Ratner founded this center in 1983. We, uh, he started with one XPS system. And over that time since then, we bought two or three more. Uh, we've expanded out the techniques. We started out, uh, we added uh, secondary ion mass spectrometry, added the scanning probes, went to the synchrotron to do near-edge X-ray absorption fine structure. And in recent years, we've uh, started probing directly at the liquid-solid interface using methods such as, as surface plasmon resonance uh, for biosensing and some frequency uh, generation vibrational spectroscopy to actually look at structure of materials at surfaces. And so these kind of in situ uh, uh, probing material directly at the liquid solid interface are valuable techniques to complement the ultra high vacuum technique. And obviously, we've not, so we've, we've, we've really expanded out the number of, of techniques and uh, and within a given technique, there's been been a lot of progress. And I'll take SIMS as an example because that's probably the poster child for advances. It seems like every couple of years, there's a new ion source, a new analyzer, and a, you know, new data processing method, new sample handling, all sorts of things. Lots of excitement in that field the last 10, 20 years. We started out with a quadrupole hanging off our XPS system, um, and we went on and developed again more in the polymer surface analysis of quantitation, multivariate analysis methods. Then went to a time of flight analyzers that was developed as liquid metal sources became more prevalent. You went to imaging. We've always focused on on different methods for simulating the biological environment, hydrated analysis. And in recent years, the last five, 10 years, a lot of new cluster ion beams coming onto the surface, onto the, onto the um, uh, scene that we can use to, to characterize uh, both not only the surface structure of materials, but now do three-dimensional molecular imaging and depth profiling of organic and biological materials. So very exciting developments there, everything from, from uh, Bis bismuth triatomic clusters to C60 buckyballs to now large argon clusters. So lots of lots of fun stuff going in there. And the surfaces we've been analyzed, as I mentioned, we started out mainly doing polymer surface science, then get up to the RF flow discharge deposit film, self-assembled monolayer, biorecognition materials, all sorts of arrays, DNA, protein, carbohydrate, and now a lot of efforts being put uh, at looking at cells and tissue sections. So the complexity of the surfaces we're analyzing is, is definitely on the increase. So as we have more tools at our disposal now, it's really important to realize each tool has its strength and weakness. So XPS or ESCA, that's great at doing composition on a wide range of materials, not so good at getting molecular information. You can certainly get some of it out, but typically that's a lot easier to obtain with techniques such as, as uh, mass spectrometry-based techniques like Tough Sims. Uh, you've got other techniques that will work directly at the liquid solid interface, like the scanning probes and SBR, SFG. So each of these have strengths and weaknesses. They, 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 there's no one magic bullet, no one magic technique that's going to give us all the information we need to know about a surface. So we need to be, uh, you know, think about this in terms of problem solving. What is it? What information do we need to know about the surface, and what combination of techniques do we need to use to get that information? I think is is the approach to take about that. And also, these these techniques look at different different uh, have different sampling depths. So you may have uh, different techniques that, that that will give you quantitative information about elemental composition, but you might get if you were looking at it by EDAX or some technique that probes microns into the sample versus XPS that probes uh, a few nanometers into the sample. 
uh, a lot of these things, the surface composition is different than the bulk, so you're going to necessarily get different answers from the two. That doesn't mean one or the other is wrong, they're just sampling different parts of, of the sample. So again, different techniques, different strengths and weaknesses, different sampling depths, all these need to be put together when you're trying to, to lay out an experimental plan for how do I characterize the material that's interacting with the biological environment. Another strategy that we'd like to, to use that, that uh, we start out with well-defined samples, so where we can control the structure and surface chemistry, use those to develop the analytical methodology and protocols, and then once we have those protocols in place, increase the sample complex, complexity and still, uh, and then, then uh, apply those developed uh, methodology and, and protocols and try and obtain the same level of information from complex surfaces that we do from these well-defined samples. And self-assembled monolayers is, is uh, really the, the classic example of how to control surface structure and, and chemistry and how you can systematically vary it. So now the other thing is, is when you get involved, as I mentioned, complex biological uh, uh, surfaces, you may start out with uh, detailed characterization. You may start out with a gold surface, then you put a self-assembled monolayer on it that has some ligand on it, say, say a biotin ligand, that you can come in with a, a, a streptavidin molecule, and, and streptavidin is typically a tetramer with four binding pockets. So uh, you can use one or two of the uh, binding pockets to bind to the surface. You have a couple more open. You can come in with another biotinylated protein that will then attach. And you can imagine at each step of this uh, um, process, you need to do detailed characterization, because how do you know the reaction that you proposed on your PowerPoint science actually happened. Did it go to completion? Were there side reactions, competing reactions, uh, contaminants introduced, all these sorts of things. That it, you, so you need detailed characterization after each functionalization step. Now, I'd like to get on to some of my examples. I'll probably spend most of the time talking about protein and peptide immobilization to uh, 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 to surfaces to control that, that to try and control uh, the biological performance of those surfaces. There's a lot of different ways of immobilizing proteins on surfaces via ligands, covalent bonds, charge-charge interactions, physical adsorption, coordination complexes, etc. And people are coming up with new schemes by, you know, every week there's something new proposed. And if you're really going to, to, to uh, make the PowerPoint proposal that you you've attached a protein in a certain conformation, orientation, and, and way, you've got to have tools that will characterize these proteins and say, do we really um, come up with, uh, do, do, can we really confirm that these proteins are, are in the orientation that we proposed? So uh, again, it's, it's good to take a look back and see what's been done. And I think the seminal paper was one from Buddy Ratner uh, in 1993. Uh, Manis et al. in analytical chemistry, and basically this was back with a quadrupole uh, sim system, but the key finding was that each of the amino acids in this protein produces a unique fragment that you can use to follow the concentration of that particular amino acid. And since that time, uh, uh, initially over in Belgium, John Benoit Loist and Patrick Bertrand showed how you could use these uh, variation of these amino acid intensities to get extract information about uh, conformation differences of proteins. Uh, they were working, I believe, fibrinogen on different polystyrene surfaces. And then uh, Buddy and I, in this paper by Tidwell et al., kind of laid out the schematic, uh, uh, the, our, our thoughts of how this could, how we could use this, this amino acid fragmentation pattern, intensity pattern, and, and use that to follow conformation orientation and then also one of my uh, first PhD students, Matt Wagner, uh, looked at this uh, at amino acid fragmentation patterns and, and showed how that could use, be used to identify the different proteins present on the surface. So these were some of the early studies. There's been a lot, and, and just to, to go to this uh, paper by uh, Karen Tidwell et al, that we, where we laid this out, the whole thing is, so if you look at these, these um, uh, cartoons on here, you see each of these little beads, the beads on a string, they, they represent the different amino acids, the different colors are different amino acids. And if you look at, say, fibrinogen versus albumin, uh, the, the amino acid composition of those two proteins are slightly different. And since SIMS, you can 
can use that to measure. You get a, a intensity profile of the different amino acids. You can use that, that difference in the uh, amino acid fragmentation pattern, the intensity profile of those, to differentiate between albumin and fibrinogen. You can also, let's say you have fibrinogen and you put it on an end on versus laying down straight. If it has a three-dimensional distribution of amino acids, which it does, so it's a heterogeneous uh, distribution, it's not homogeneous throughout the whole protein, and the SIM sampling depth, which is of the order of a couple nanometers, is small relative to the size of these proteins that are five or ten nanometers, you can imagine that, uh, again, you have this three-dimensional uh, distribution of amino acids, you can use that, and you will see subtle differences in the amino acid intensity pattern, fragmentation pattern. These are much smaller than what you see from protein to protein, but within a given protein, you will see differences if it's in different conformations, if, if it's in a native state, if it's uh, denatured and unfolded on the surface, if it's in a different uh, orientation, all these things can, can be followed with SIMS. And uh, so the bottom line is, is uh, uh, there's been a lot of work both in our group and others around the world to show that, uh, uh, that you can use these SIMS amino acid fragmentation patterns, uh, usually coupled with multivariate analysis to identify what types of proteins are present on the surface, what's their concentration, what's their conformation, orientation, and, and spatial distribution. And I list a couple of reviews that, that, that highlight some of these, the key articles that, and the advances that have been made. There, there, are, there are several that are you know, paper, key papers in this field and, that are summarized in, in the review uh, references listed at the bottom. What I'll talk about now are some of the things that have happened in the last couple of years that, that uh, show kind of where we are on our way to uh, getting there. One of the interesting things is if we can make a uh, pattern surface by standard photolithography techniques, put different ligands in different regions, can we then expose that, that pattern surface to a mixture of proteins and will the proteins self-sort into the different regions? So we did this. Uh, in conjunction with Dave Granger's group at, at the University of Utah, and we made we we made a pattern surface that this kind of uh, dartboard pattern, where in one reach one one uh, set of regions we had biotin tags which are selective to the protein streptavidin, and in the other region we had chloroalkane which is selective to the halo tags, and so each of these are 500 by 500 micron images. So again. This, this was sort of garden variety photolithography, had a spatial resolution of, of three, four, five uh, microns sort of thing. And what you see is the pattern is different if we're looking at different amino acids. Turns out streptavidin does not have any of the sulfur-containing amino acids, cysteine and, and methionine. So if we map the methionine concentration, we see where the halo tag bound to the surface, because these are surfaces have the two different uh, ligands and then exposed to a mixture of streptavidin and halotag proteins. So uh, the image on the left shows the cysteine plus methionine. Then the other thing, if we look at, at, at uh, the other the three other amino acids, tyrosine, um, tryptophan, and threonine, those are all enriched in, in higher concentrations in streptavidin relative to halotag. And sure enough, the opposite regions light up there. So we know where the streptavidin goes, we know where the halotag goes. So now we can do this protein identification in a spatially resolved manner. And we want to take that one step further. So we said, okay, if we have two different proteins, we can easily see the difference. What if we have the same protein? In this case, we'll use an antibody. And if we have in one region, we have protein A immobilized on the surface, which should interact specifically with the FC region of the antibody. And in the other regions, we have antifluorescein, which should interact with the FAB region. Now, it turns out that the antibody we're looking at, the amino acids in the FAB versus the FC region are, are they're in slightly different concentrations. Can we use that concentration different to, uh, to, to image it? And the answer is yes. So first of all, we looked at what's the sum of the amino acids. This tells us the amino acid peak. This tells us that, that uh, uh, do we have equal amounts of protein in, in the two areas? And the answer is no. There's uh, certain regions that, that have more protein than other regions, so more effectively binding. But then we can look at, at a ratio of amino acids that should be enriched in the FC versus the FAB, and also we see a pattern there. So we see 
the areas that have the lower protein are more enriched in the FC fragment. More of it is the FAB down, bound down to the surface. So you can even tell differences in the orientation on different regions of the sample with the SIMS technique. So I think there's a lot of, and there's a lot of scope for, for further improving it, but we're getting at a fairly kind of molecular level uh, or, or orient, you know, be able to follow protein conformation, protein orientation, that sort of thing in a spatially resolved manner. So that's pretty exciting stuff out there. Um, what are some of the other things? Uh, we're very interested now with all these new ion sources being developed. What's the effect of the ion source on uh, analyzing protein films? And so here I show a joint study that was done with uh, the Korean Institute of Sciences and uh, uh, and standards. Uh, this is Daewon Moon and Tego Lee. Uh, so we looked at on a couple, on three different instruments and a variety of different ion sources. Very interesting. So I show the, the this, this is multivariate analysis. So we're plotting the scores from PC1 versus PC versus sample number for BSA uh, monolayer on mica and fibrinogen monolayer on mica on the left hand side. And what you see is the monotonic clusters, the cesium, the gold, the bismuth. So cesium was taken on a phi 7200. Gold was taken on the, on an ion, the gold uh, monotonic was taken on the ion tough instrument in Korea and the bismuth monotonic was taken on our instrument in Seattle. So you see all those kind of kept clustered together and then the spores kind of as you go up and you go to, to uh, the bismuth three, both the single and double charge, you see some significant differences, and then you go on to the C60, and you see a lot of differences. And if you look at the loadings, you look at this amino acid fragmentation pattern. Now, it's going to be the same because you've got the same amino acid on the same substrate, but what happens is you see more of the lower mass fragments, more intense on with, this, with the C60 clusters, and more of the higher mass uh, amino acid fragments with the monotonic. So you're really seeing extent of fragmentation. And then if you look on the right hand side, one of the questions we had, what makes a bigger difference? Is it a type of protein or the type of, of primary ion used? And the answer is the type of primary ion. If you look across the top, you can see in PC1, which accounts for the largest variation in the in the data across the sample set, uh, nearly half the variation in the data, you can see that that there's a specific order from cesium to and uh, gold bismuth monotonics, and then the triatomics, and then the C60, and then on PC2, you see it's separated by protein. So the ion sources have more difference, uh, have more influence on the, the, the fragmentation pattern than you're getting than the type of protein. So uh, some interesting things that way. We've also tried to, to push this, uh, the SIMS analysis of, of uh, further, all the stuff I've, I've shown you previously uh, have been on proteins that are large, typically five to 10 nanometers uh, in, in dimension, sometimes even larger, but uh, relative to the SIM sampling depth of a couple nanometers. What if you go down and have a protein that's essentially the same size? And so we've used this mo uh, protein G uh, one that, that uh, doesn't have any native cysteines. And so my colleague, Pat Staten, who's a great protein engineer, he can put cysteines at either uh, the C terminus or N terminus, and we can get different orientations of these molecules. So these are these little barrel shaped proteins about three nanometers in height, very similar to the uh, uh, sampling depth of the of the SIMS. And uh, you know we want to say, can SIMS actually tell us whether we flip these in different orientations? And the answer is yes. And we can actually use the SIMS to help us define our experimental conditions for how we do this. So if you look at, at, at pH, if you do this immobilization at pH 7 at uh, normal concentration of, of buffer, you don't see any difference in this ratio of, of, of amino acids that are located near the C terminus to, uh, to, uh, to the N terminus, pretty flat, whether you do the different mutants or a 50-50 mixture of the two. But if you increase the salt concentration or increase the pH, now you see a significant change and you're actually seeing the orientation. And, and also if you put this mutant just directly down on bare gold, the sulfur from the cysteine will bind to the, the gold and you can also get preferential orientation that way. So again, you can use this and to develop optimum methods for orienting proteins. Now I've talked about, again, with the SIMS, we're trying to look at overall confirmation, orientation, that sort of thing. 
we'd really like to know at a more uh, uh, much more detailed level what are some of the structures of these proteins what direction are our side chains oriented with respect to the surface which side chains are oriented with the surface that sort of thing and so if you go out in the protein database there's tens of thousands of structures out there that have been determined by x-ray crystallography on uh, uh, protein crystals solution uh, uh, NMR studies of proteins in solution and you can get like angstrom level uh, information about bond distances bond angles all these sorts of things very detailed information to my knowledge there is not one uh, structure in the protein database of a protein adsorbed onto a surface just because things like x-ray diffraction and solution phase NMR those techniques that work very well under those conditions can't, do not have the sensitivity to probe a monolayer or submonolayer amount of protein on the surface. So the question is, how can we get that information? And the approach that we're taking is really uh, combining this protein engineering. So working with uh, Pat Staten and his group at the University of Washington, they can prepare some very interesting mutants with isotopically labeled peptides and proteins that make ideal probes so we can systematically look at different parts of the, of the peptide or protein and then we have to have a combined experimental approach. So we do have some, some uh, solid state NMR techniques. This is Gary Drobny and his group at the University of Washington that have developed some sophisticated NMR techniques for looking at adsorbed peptides and proteins. We use our UHV techniques such as, as, as time of light SIMS as I described in the previous slide. The other technique that we found extremely valuable are these nonlinear optical methods such as some frequency generation vibrational spectroscopy and you get that information to get more a molecular understanding of the different components but you're probably still not going to get this atomic level where are all the atoms in the proteins uh, it's just going to be very difficult to do with the experimental techniques but hopefully you can get enough structural constraints in terms of which which side chains are oriented uh, interacting with the surface uh, an idea of the angles of those side chains that sort of thing that then you can supply that information to people doing molecular dynamic simulations and they can take that use the constraints to some of these guided molecular dynamic simulations and that are guided by the constraints of the experimental condition to really take it to the next level and get more atomic level information so that's the approach and we're making some progress so I thought I'd talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing to do that so again to start out with a well-defined system we like to use peptides and you can use an, uh, this is a model system that just has uh, leucine and lysine. So L for leucine and K for lysine, that's the amino acid code. And depending on the sequence you do, you can get this, the backbone to form an alpha helix. And the most important thing is, is the lysines are on one side of the helix and the leucines are on the other. So you have a hydrophobic side and you have a, 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 a side that can be charged, you can be protonated. Uh, so you can have an electrostatic interaction on one side and a hydrophobic interaction on the other. And so, and, and if you change that sequence, you can then put it into a beta sheet strain, uh, strain and you can see that, that, again, you have leucines on one side and lysines on the other. So this you would expect to orient in different uh, 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 directions on different types of surfaces. And one of the things we looked at is if you had a carboxylic acid terminated SAM and it, it was charged negatively and the, and the amine was charged positively, which should be the case at, uh, at uh, around uh, neutral pH, pH 7, then you should have this electrostatic interaction and the uh, 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 lysine side of the, uh, of the peptide should come down and interact with the surface. And if you have a methyl terminated surface, uh, then, then the leucine should come down through hydrophobic interactions and do that. Well, if you look at this with SIMS and you say, can I see this orientation difference if I just follow the ratio of, of the characteristic fragments from leucine to lysine, which is 84 to 86, and if you're looking at the helical peptide, no, you can't see that. It, 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 there's some indications there might be some, some, some small changes, but they're basically within the, the uh, the uh, the error of the measurement the, within experimental error. The reason being is this peptide is less than two nanometers top to bottom, looking on in an end-on configuration, which is less than sim sampling depth, and also within 
on each side you have a hemispherical distribution of leucines and lysines. So, so there's not a distinct separation. Now, if we go to the beta sheet, which, which again is about the same size, one, uh, just under two nanometers uh, top to bottom, but they are well separated and you can pack it in. And now, either at, at submonolayer, say a, a quarter to half a monolayer, which is labeled low here, or high, which is monolayer concentration, as determined by XPS, you can see significant differences of, of this ratio of the 84 to 86 peak consists, showing you that even for these small peptides, if they're well ordered and the the different functional groups are are well separated, we have no trouble picking up the orientation difference. So we can see that we can flip these depending on the surface, but this is a UHV technique. What happens when we go to other techniques? And so the reason why some frequency generation is, is so valuable for in situ techniques is that an optical based technique. You're, you are overlapping in time and space a visible beam and an IR beam, and you're coming off with a sum frequency beam. Uh, the current data I'll show you is using a picosecond system, so then we have to scan the IR to get our spectrum. You can also, uh, we're also in the process of building a femtosecond system that will have, do broadband spectrum. So again, then in one pulse, we can get to cover the whole CH region, uh, amide region, et cetera. Now, the nice thing about this SFG in the nonlinear optical process, it needs a break in the inversion symmetry to be SFG active. So if you have uh, a bulk material, it's typically either uh, a single crystal, it could be well-ordered uh, or, uh, or disordered, you're not going to get an SFG signal from the bulk because you have inversion symmetry or you have disorder. In the same way, out in the uh, medium around it, you could have water around it. It's typically disordered, so you're not going to get a signal. So you only get a signal at the interface where the inversion symmetry is broken, and then you only get it for ordered species at that interface. So it, you, it's a very nice probe for probing ordered materials at interfaces, and you can do it directly at the liquid solid interface. So our setup is an EPSLA system. Uh, this is the picosecond system. We typically use a calcium fluoride window and come in from the backside orientation with the visible and IR and pull the, the uh, some frequency also out from the backside. We put a variety of different coatings on this uh, calcium fluoride or barium fluoride crystal uh, prism so we can uh, get specific surface chemistries and then we immerse that in a buffer or water solution and then inject a peptide and we can follow kinetics in addition to looking at structural information. So if we go back to our uh, LK uh, peptide, and we've looked at this both in situ and uh, and, and air dried, and the, 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 the uh, orientation of the peptide stays the same, but basically we can look at the CH region, and if, we, and if we're looking on a methyl SAM, we don't want interference from the methyl group, so we deuterate it, so we look at a fully deuterated uh, methyl SAM and absorb the peptide on it, so then the only CH stretches that we see are from the methyl groups on the leucine, and then we can also, on the other one, then we can, we can uh, uh, since there are no methyl groups on the carboxylic acid terminated SAM, labeled here MUDA, uh, we know the methyl uh, signatures are coming from the uh, SAM, from the leucine groups on the SAM. And what you can see is these resonance, uh, these, these CH stretches, uh, interact with the non-resident background from the gold, and they can be either in phase or out of phase depending on the direction that they're pointing. And you'll get a you'll have the same uh, peaks, but the line shapes will be different. And sure enough, we can see that on the carboxylic acid SAM, the leucines are pointing, or the leucines are pointing away from the surface, lysines are pointing down, and we have an opposite orientation on the methyl terminated SAMs. So we can also follow their assembly by, by scaling the peaks uh, uh, as a function of time and measuring the intensity as a function of time. Uh, so this was done on a fluorocarbon surface, again, a hydrophobic surface, so we'd expect the, and, and we, we know that CH, uh, uh, the methyl groups from the leucine come down and interact with that. What we see is the ordering of these methyl groups is instantaneous. It, it, within the time resolution of our instrument, it occurs within a couple minutes. It just pops right up to, and it stays constant. On the other hand, the amide one grows in over time. So the side chains order right away, but the backbone takes a while for it to, to orient and, and, and align. So there's kind of an initial first very rapid 
adsorption and interaction of the side chains with the surface, and then a slower, on a slower time scale, the uh, the orientation of these uh, of the backbone of the of the the alpha helical nature with the surface. So again, you could follow these sorts of different things in situ. These are all in situ in real time uh, experiments. Now, I mentioned we really would like to look at individual side chain orientations. We can do that by uh, isotopic labeling. So uh, I've got a, a schematic of, a, of the uh, leucine isopropyl group and where it's, it's shown in yellow on there, uh, we've substituted hydrogens for deuteriums. We can do this on an, on, a, on an individual residue by residue basis. So we can go through and individually uh, label each leucine side chain. And then we can collect spectra from that. And we can, uh, again, uh, by, by doing that in a variety of different polarizations, we can extract things like uh, side chain uh, orientation. And I'll talk a little bit about it on that. So what we want to do, we want to look at the CD stretch. So when we go down to the CD stretch, we are looking at the CD stretch from an individual leucine side chain. And we can look at that with different orientations of the IR and visible and SFG. So we can, again, change that. We see both symmetric and asymmetric stretches of this, uh, of the CD stretches in, in these uh, deuterated methyl groups of the leucine. And uh, by comparing intensity ratios for, say, the symmetric in the PPP versus SSP or the asymmetric in the PPP versus SPS orientation, we can, we can, uh, th that will have finite, uh, each of those will have finite values. And we can do calculations if we understand how the different uh, components of the of the tensor that goes into this uh, SFG intensity and allowed loud uh, vibrations and, and that sort of thing. We can do all these calculations. We can match it all up. I'll I'll spare you all the math on that. But I think on the next slide, I just show a summary where we can actually come up with a tilt and twist angle for each of the different side chains. And and I've shown this in, in cartoon por portion on the left. And so uh, you can see that, that these different leucines make different angles with respect to the surface. And here, uh, these leucines are all pointed up. That means the polystyrene is actually at the upper end of that, uh, on top of that. And you can see that the leucine 8 and leucine 11 are the ones that are, are more closely pointing to the polystyrene surface, and the leucine 12 and 14 are more pointing parallel to it. And in fact, that correlates very nicely with NMR data that Gary Drobny's group has taken, where he looks at the range of motion and, and how much freedom the, these different side chains have to move about. The leucine 8 and 11 are very, have very little motion. The leucine 12 and 14 have a lot more motion, which makes sense if they're not constrained down by the surface. So again, you can start to get a very detailed understanding of which side chains are pointing where and then tie that in with molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention, Zhang Chen's group at the University of Michigan has done a lot of work looking at different polarization combinations and seeing that, how that affects the intensity of the amide bands. And from that, they've developed methodology where you can use that, the change of intensity of the amide band as a function of polarization to actually get orientation of that uh, uh, of the backbone uh, with respect to, to the surface normal. And so again, this is one particular example I show here. They've, they've done it for several different systems. So that combination, so you can not only get side chain orientation like I showed in the previous slide uh, by selective uh, isotopic labeling, you can also uh, get very detailed information about overall backbone orientation too. So I'd like to, I spent a fair amount of time on uh, the protein and peptide. I think we are getting to the point where now we can, uh, we're, we're starting to ramp up, look at, at uh, more larger proteins, that sort of thing. But with this combination of, of protein engineering, using solid state NMR, time of flight sims, some frequency generation, that sort of thing, we're starting to get a fair amount of molecular detail about how proteins and peptides interact with surfaces that we can, can then partner with the uh, people doing molecular dynamic simulation. So I want to finish up by uh, a few slides on nanoparticles. And, and these have been widely used. And, and as I mentioned previously, a lot of the people that use them and fabricate them really, uh, uh, ha until recently, have not thought of much about what is the surface structure, how you functionalize it, because you want to prepare them, 
functionalize them, and then put them in the biological environment. All very complex things. There's a lot of challenges to this, and there's been a few papers written in recent years talking about these challenges of when you're synthesizing them, it's not a clean model system that you're synthesizing. There's all sorts of stabilization agents, additives, and contaminants that are present in the solution. How many of these get down onto the surface? And then when you functionalize it, there's a whole host of, of reactions you're trying to occur. They typically don't go to completion. There might be competing reactions. And then you, how do you track these nanoparticles that are essentially the same size as proteins in the complex biological environment? So there's a lot of challenges. Some of these review papers talk a bit about that. And I'm going to talk about gold nanoparticles. So just making it, there's a lot of experimental conditions. What kind of these are typically used by citrate reduction of uh, gold chloride uh, to, to make different sized nanoparticles. And you end up with citrate covered gold nanoparticles. Well, what citrate concentration do you use? Uh, what's the rate of addition? What's the solution temperature, reagent purity, et cetera? Lots of different experimental parameters that you have to tweak that you can use to control the, diff the final size, the size distribution, the shape, all these sorts of things. And then once you get them, then you want to, you may not want a citrate covered gold nanoparticle. You may want uh, to functionalize it. You may want to use a thiol, uh, come in with a thiol to displace that citrate. It has some sort of functionality on it uh, that you can, maybe a carboxylic acid that you can then functionalize and tether a protein to, and then you inject them into a, uh, an animal. And how do you follow that? All sorts of things. Each thing need to be characterized in detail. What I want to talk about is some model studies we've been doing with gold nanoparticles. We've been using three different uh, size ranges, 14, 25, and 40 average uh, 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 nanoparticle size. These are diameters. And as a control, we certainly use the flat surface. Uh, we then functionalize these with different chain-like carboxylic acids. and uh, and, and the question being is, is how can, you know, we're, we're using these as model systems to develop the, the surface analytical uh, methodology so we can characterize these things. So the first thing you do, and, and this is almost everybody does this, is that you, you look at this with transmission electron microscopy to look at the size, shape, distribution. Uh, I'll spend a lot of time talking about the 14 nanometer because it's a very, very circular, very spherical nanoparticles, very tight distribution of sizes, so very uniform, so a uh, nice thing to look at. But we have looked at all three of these in a fair amount of detail with all the different carboxylic acids. I give you the reference down there for characterization with a, a, a wide range of techniques. So we have a pretty good idea about what's going on in these materials. The critical thing, as everybody that's done XPS knows, that is, you increase the chain length of this of the carboxylic acid thiol, uh, then you're you're putting a thicker layer down on the surface. You attenuate the gold more, so you're putting more carbon down, attenuating the gold more. So your your carbon to, to gold ratio increases as a function of chain length. And if you look at that on the flat surfaces, okay, that's that's fine. You look at it on the 14 nanometer, you see the same trend. But if you compare the 14 nanometer to the flat surface, you see a difference. And so that's because you, on these nanoparticles, you don't have a well-defined takeoff angle. You collect data from all angles. And so you're going to get a different carbon to gold ratio. On flat surfaces, we're used to relating a specific carbon to gold ratio to a given thickness. You, so how do that, that relationship that you've used for flat surfaces obviously does not hold for nanoparticles. So how do we deal with that? And so again, here is just another uh, way of looking at this. We know how to calculate an overlayer thickness on a flat gold. We can, uh, I've showed the Beardle's Law equation down there that's been used for, for a long, long time. Works extremely well. We can't apply it directly to the gold nanoparticles because here, again, here's the carbon to gold ratio of the C16 carboxylic acid SAM. So it ha should have roughly the same thickness on each of the nanoparticles and the flat gold. But you see as you decrease the uh, nanoparticle size, you see an increase in this ratio. So obviously, the curvature of these nanoparticles are having an influence on the carbon to gold ratio. So what we did, again, we took this C16 uh, carboxylic acid terminated SAM on gold. So the sulfur is down bonded to the gold surface. You have the, this alkyl chain, and then you have the carboxylic acid group up at the top. And you, we use this as our model system. And we want to say, OK, how can we? measure the thickness of this particular self-assembled monolayer on gold nanoparticles. 
So we assume the gold nanoparticles were spherical, which our TEM evidence says, okay, to a first approximation, that's true. Um, obviously, it's going to be made up of facets of 11110 orientation, have terraces, edges, and things like this. But for 14 nanometers, it's still a, a reasonable starting point. We divided that up into nine uh, concentric cylinders, and we said the top of each of that cylinder we could, could uh, relate to an average takeoff angle of 5, 15, 25 degrees. And then we could, but since the size of these gold nanoparticles is large relative to the XPS sampling depth, we, don't, we can view this as kind of an infinite surface. We can view this as a flat plane with just a different takeoff angle. So all we have to worry about is, is what's the relative carbon to gold uh, ratio at these different uh, takeoff angles. So we can model that, which we did. And so the experimental results are in the top panel showing how carbon increases as you decrease, as you increase takeoff angle and decrease sampling depth. So zero is coming off along the sample normal and, and 85 is nearly parallel to the surface. And as, so you have more surface sensitivity, your sampling depth decreases as you increase the uh, photoelectron takeoff angle. And so it's not surprising, you see more carbon because you're seeing more of the SAM, you see the gold for, fall off because you're not sampling as much of the gold substrate. Oxygen goes up because oxygen's at the outer surface. Sulfur, it's hard to see an experimental trend because the signal's low and there's a fair amount of noise. Now then we use uh, 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 the, the the simulated, so this is simulated electron spe spectra for surface analysis, a program developed by Cedric Pallet Nist and Wolfgang Werner in Austria. And uh, you, we put in all the parameters and we had uh, a, a normal spacing between CH2 groups of 1.2 angstroms. Uh, the relative surface roughness, because these aren't perfectly flat films, were, was 1.04. And what you see is between zero, between five and 55, we'll get very nice agreement between CESA and the experimental results. But as we get more surface sensitive, we see the carbon in the experimental uh, results continues to go up while the uh, while in the CESA it goes down. The gold again matches fairly nicely overall takeoff angles and then and then the oxygen again there's a disagreement at the uh, glancing angles where, where CESA predicts much more oxygen than carbon. So right away this tells us that the model that we are initially thinking of may not be the appropriate model. And after a lot of different control experiments and checking to make sure everything was fine, what we realized is these carboxylic acid surfaces, after we pull them out of the ethanol solution and rinse them, they're exposed to air before they're put in the UHV chamber. These are very high surface energy uh, material in air. It's not surprising. Uh, hydrocarbons are ubiquitous everywhere that we pick up a little bit of hydrocarbon contamination. So if we add one and a half angstroms of a hydrocarbon contamination layer on top of the SAMs, then all of a sudden the simulations agree very nicely with the experimental results. So again, by using the, the simulation and the, and the experiment together, we can get much more detailed understanding of what our sample actually looks like. So once we are happy that we could match everything up on the flat surfaces, then how do we put all that back together again uh, and do that. So we measured the nanoparticle composition, which is the uh, far left-hand corner. Again, you see carbon, gold, oxygen, sulfur. Since you get the full range of, of, of takeoff angles, it doesn't matter what the, the uh, underlying substrate, what angle it is with respect to the analyzers. I've just given you the data where it's nominally zero, but uh, we get the same uh, composition within experimental air, regardless of how we tilt the sample. What you can see is what if we use a magic takeoff angle? We assume 55 degrees is a way of, 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 of being a magic takeoff angle from a flat gold. We get pretty reasonable agreement. And if you look along the bottom row, you see uh, the kind of the sum of the errors between the measured the, the uh, uh, measured flat surface data at 55 degrees versus the nanoparticle data. So we're in reasonable agreement. We can do a little better if we do a geometric uh, average over the of all the takeoff angles, get a little closer. And if we do the simulated data, well, the 45 degrees gets us the closest result. Uh, and again, if we uh, do the geometric correction, then we 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 go down. Notice, we see a noticeable improvement, but we have to add that 
contamination layer. If you see on the far right hand side where we don't have the contamination layer, we get very poor agreement. So the contamination layer is present both on the nanoparticles and on the flat surfaces. And in fact, if we if we actually contract the size of the of the overlayer by about three angstroms or so, we get almost perfect agreement between the measured and the simulated. And uh, again, that's probably not unreasonable to think that the uh, uh, the, the self-assembled monolayer on the gold nanoparticle is a little uh, thinner than it is on the flat surface because you have a lot more defects, uh, probably more disorder of the films, all these sorts of things which could result in a slightly thinner film. So just to summarize this data, as I pointed out, uh, all these uh, all the carboxylic acid SAMs uh, seem to be covered with a, a thin layer of hydrocarbon contamination. The CESA results are uh, can very uh, do a nice job of modeling the experimental uh, XPS results for both flat and nanoparticle surfaces, and the SAM seem to be slightly thinner on the gold nanoparticle. With that, I'd just like to finish up, and, and I've, I've given an overview of a lot of work that's been done primarily at the University of Washington through the uh, NESAC BioCenter, and I want to acknowledge all the students, postdoc staff, investigators, collaborators that have contributed to that, NIH for through a variety of different grants that have funded that, and I've just picked out some, some pictures here of the group over, over the last 10 years of uh, some of the people that have come through and been part of all this, and I thank you for your attention.